everyone, and welcome to Xinhua Live Show. I'm Han Qian, Xinhua correspondent in France. We're now at the Palace of Versailles, where the Treaty of Versailles was signed 100 years ago. You must be familiar with this part of history, which marked the end of the World War I. However, do you know that the signing of this treaty has sparked a movement in China in 1919, which is known as the May Fourth Movement? In today's live show, we're going to present you this part of the Chinese history by doing a relay live show both in France and in China. Let's first start from where the Paris Peace Conference was held in 1919. The Paris Peace Conference, also known as Versailles Peace Conference, was the meeting of the victorious Allied powers following the end of the World War I to set the peace terms for the defeated Central Powers. The conference began on January 18, 1919. It involved 32 countries and nationalities. Despite American support, the Western powers refused China's claims, transferring the German concessions to Japan instead. The May 4th movement started with mass student protests on May 4th, 1919, against the government's response to the Treaty of Versailles that imposed unfair treaties on China and undermined the country's sovereignty after the World War I. It then triggered a national campaign to overthrow the old society and promote new ideas including science, democracy and Marxism. At a gathering held several days ago in Beijing to mark the centenary of the May 4th movement, Chinese President Xi Jinping said the movement was a great patriotic and revolutionary campaign pioneered by advanced young intellectuals and joined by people from all walks of life to resolutely fight imperialism and feudalism. With its mighty force, the May 4th movement inspired the ambition and confidence of the Chinese people and nation to realize national rejuvenation. Xi said the movement gave birth to the great spirit centered on patriotism, progress, democracy and science, with patriotism at the core. Li Dajiao and Chen Duxiu, both founders of the Communist Party of China, were the leaders of the May 4th movement. Some of Li Dajiao's stories will be shared to you later. You're watching Xinhua Live Show. I'm Han Qian, Xinhua correspondent in France. As we mark the 100th anniversary of the May 4th movement in China today, we're presenting you this part of the history by doing this live broadcast in China. We're now outside the Palace of Versailles to initiate this live broadcast, which involves four episodes. Besides Paris, you will also be taken to two other spots in Beijing and another one in Montargis, France. Now I would like to leave the floor to my colleague in Beijing, where you will be taken to two other locations, which both have very close connections with the May 4th movement. What were the stories there? Please stay tuned and follow my colleague in Beijing. Okay, thanks for my colleague Han Tian's introduction from Paris. We're doing a relay live streaming on the 100th anniversary of the May the 4th movement. I'm Sun Qi, broadcasting live from the Red Building of Peking University. This is the place 
where may, the May the Fourth movement started from. Okay, let's now let, let's take a tour to this uh, very old building and explore the red history of China. Now we are on the first floor of the Red Building of Peking University. Today we are going to Li Dazhao's office and the Renaissance Magazine room. Okay, the next spot we are going to see is Li Dazhao's office. Li Dazhao is one of the most important founders of the China Communism Party. Between January 1918 and December 1922, Li Dazhao worked here as the chief librarian of Peking University. Through a series of overhauling and reform, he helped transform this library from an old-style book collecting building to a modern university library in its real sense. Here is the place Li Dazhao met with other teachers and some students who became participants of the May the Fourth movement then. Okay, the next spot I'm going to show you is the Renaissance Magazine Room, which is also pretty important in the Red Building. This is Xinhua in Beijing, and this is uh, uh, the second part of a live streaming on the 100th anniversary of the May the Fourth Movement. We are now at the room of the Renaissance Magazine. Today we are very honored to have Zhi Jian here to introduce some uh, information about this, this room for us. Zhi Jian, hey, you uh, on the eve of the May the Fourth, students from Peking University, headed by members of the Renaissance Society, made more than three thousand flags and play cards here. 在当晚有一位学生代表罗嘉伦他就是站在这个桌旁一气呵成写出了北京全体学界通告他发出了中国的土地可以征服不可以断送中国的人民可以杀戮不可以低头的最强呐喊 
。后来这份通告还在北大红楼的半地下室连夜印刷出了两万多份，分发给了街头观看的人群。And Lord Dalton drafted the declaration of the entire educational circle of Peking, which cried it out: "The land of China would rather be conquered than betrayed." The Chinese people would rather be slaughtered than humiliated. The declaration printed 20,000 copies before the demonstrators started their march. Turned out to be the only printed matter of that day. This part of live streaming is over. Let's look forward to the next part. Uh, my colleague Pang Yuanyuan will introduce you Li Da Zhou's old residence in Beijing. Hello and welcome. You are watching the live stream broadcast by Xinhua News Agency. I'm Pang Yuanyuan. Thanks to my colleagues in Paris and another spot in Beijing, which is the Red Building of Peking University. Now we're in the Wenhua Alley, and this is the former residence of Li Da Zhao. Li Da Zhao is one of the founders of Communist Party of China. And today we are very honored to have the administrator of this former residence, Mr. Liu Yang, with us to have a tour visit of Li Da Zhao's former residence and to sharing his story. Of his life in Beijing. Liu 老师，你好，你好。嗯，我们看到这个门口有一个李大钊的雕像，给我们介绍一下李大钊。呃，这个呢是大钊先生的一个雕像。大钊先生呢，生于一八八九年的十月二十九日，牺牲一九二七年的四月二十八日。There is a statue of Li Da Zhao who was born in 1889 and was killed by a warlord in 1927. Li Da Zhao is one of the founders of Communist Party of China. Mr. Liu will show us around this residence and tell us more stories about Li Da Zhao's life here in Beijing. Beijing can be the second home of Li Da Zhao. 在他不足三十八岁一生中呢，有十年是在北京度过的。Beijing was the second hometown to Li Da Zhao, and he spent almost a decade in Beijing of his life. 在北京这十年中呢，大钊先生在这个小院住了将近四年时间，是他在北京居住时间最长的一处居所。During his stay in Beijing, Li Da Zhao spent four years here in this very yard. The residence covers about 500 meters, and this is the living room of Li Da Zhao's former residence. His family meets friends and have dinner here. These两人都是在里面，好像对，待会儿这个他。还没呢。哦，将近五百平米吧。西尔房呢，是他大女儿李新华曾经的卧室。这间呢，是他们夫妻的卧室。他们夫妻两个人生活时间在一起最长的，就
Hello and welcome again. You are watching the live stream broadcast by Xinhua News Agency, and I'm Pang Yuan. Today we are broadcast by a theme of May Fourth Movement 100th Anniversary. Previously, we had the episode of Paris and another spot in Beijing. Here, we are in the former residence of a founder of Communist Party of China, Li Dazhao. And today, we are very lucky to have the administrator of this former residence, Liu Yang, Mr. Liu Yang. 李老师，继续给我们介绍一下这个屋子的情况。这间屋子呢，是李达昭同志的书房。这间屋子里啊，在大昭先生在此写就了很多的文章，文章总量占他全部文章的将近三分之一左右。This room is the study room of Li Dazhao, where he has written one third of his whole life articles here in this very room. Lidazhao had committed himself to the liberation of nation, and in Peking University, he participated in the editorial work of New York, as well as he also. Devoted himself to the May Fourth and New Culture Movement. We see there are a lot of historical pictures and newspapers who recorded the May Fourth Movement. Liu 老师，我们看到这儿有一些珍贵的资料，可以给我们介绍一下吗？呃，这个呢叫《北京市民宣言》，这是一个传单。中文部分由大昭先生和陈独秀共同起草的，英文部分是由胡适先生来翻译完成的。This is a manifesto of the citizens of Peking. It is written by Li Dazhao and Chen Duxiu, and it's also translated by Hu Shi. This lower right And we see in this old newspaper there is a picture reflect the parade of May Fourth movement. This is a. This was a students' parade during the May Fourth Movement. 呃，这个标语呢是学生在五四运动游行队伍中打出来的。This is a slogan paper, a Peking University students used during the May Fourth Movement. It said, it called for return to Qingdao. 好，谢谢刘老师今天带我们参观。Thank you very much. Bye bye. And few years later, after the May Fourth Movement, more Chinese news choose to study abroad to study new knowledge and new idea, and most of them choose France, including Zhou Enlai, Deng Xiaoping, and artist Xu Beihong, Ba Jin, and Xian Xinghai, and so on. Uh, now let's give the floor back to France to my colleague and continue our broadcast. Hello, I'm Xinhua reporter Zheng Jianghua. Many thanks to my colleagues in Paris and Beijing in the relay live streaming. I'm now in Montargis, a small French town about 100 kilometers south of Paris. The building behind me, as its French name shows, 
is the Museum of the History of Sino-Franco Friendship. But its Chinese name, which translates literally as the Museum of the Village Work Frugal Study Movement in Montakji, gives us the keywords. Encouraged by the main force movement, thousands of young Chinese men and women went to France working in factories to pay for their studies. That's the diligent work frugal study movement. Let's go inside to explore. This man is Li Shizhen. He is a leading proponent of the diligent work frugal study movement. He was born in 1881 in the ailing years of Qing dynasty. He journeyed to France in 1902, where he studied science. He was a supporter of Sun Yat-sen, who led the revolution that ended imperial rule in China. In 1908, Li, who was then an entrepreneur, opened Europe's first binker factory in a Paris suburb. He used the factory as a base for the diligent work frugal study program. In the 1920s, more than 300 Chinese youngsters worked and studied in Montaxi, including late Chinese leader. Deng Xiaoping. Let's go upstairs to get a glimpse of Deng Xiaoping's life in Montaxi. This building has a history of more than three hundred years. From the outset, Mrs. Wang Peiwen, chairwoman of French Chinese Friendship Association in Montaxi, rented this building to exhibit the history of the work study movement. In June 2015, the government of Hunan Province of China bought the building, and after the renovation, the museum was open to the public in August 2016. Now you are watching Xinhua Relay live streaming, marking the centenary of the May Fourth Movement. My colleagues in Paris and Beijing has already taken you to three important locations related to the May Fourth Movement. Now I'm in the Museum of the History of Sino-Franco Friendship in France. Let's continue. This is a photo of the young Deng Xiaoping. He embarked on his journey by sea to France in 1920. When he was 16 years old, from 1922 to 1923, he lived in Montargis, where he worked in the Hutchinson rubber foot factory. Over there, we can find Deng's work card and residence permit. At the Hutchinson rubber boot factory, Deng often worked 10 hours a day. To save money to enroll in a local college. Decades later, Deng became one of China's top leaders. On the bottom of this bronze sculpture, we can see the inscriptions by a number of world leaders, including late South African leader Nelson Mandela. This one is the inscription by Samarange, honorary president for life of the International Olympic Committee. Quote: In my opinion, Deng Xiaoping was one of the greatest politicians of the 20th century. His goal was to increase the well-being of the biggest population in the world. He achieved this, and what is more, succeeded in convincing the People's Republic of China that the country has a Brilliant future ahead of it. This photo shows that 
in 1975, then Prime Minister of France, Jacques Chirac, received visiting Zheng, the then Vice Premier of China. It was the first time Chinese leaders paid an official visit to a Western major power. Besides Deng, there are a number of youngsters who study and work in France playing prominent roles in China's modern history, including Zhou Enlai, who became the premier of the People's Republic of China, and Chen Yi, who served as mayor of Shanghai as foreign minister of China. Besides this museum, there are 11 commemorative sites in connection with the work study movement in Montagji. Now let's head to the Park Duzi, which is a three minutes walk from here. Montagji is a typically quaint French provincial town. It is nicknamed Petit Venice de Gardinet, or the small Venice of Gardinet, as the town nestles between the Briar Canal and the Venison River. This town has a special place in Deng Xiaoping's heart. Almost 16 years later, when receiving a delegation from Montagji in 1982, then told the guests they had a strong impression of the small town. He remembered Mrs. Rose, who was in charge of the registration at the Hutchinson Rubber Boot Factory, has eyes in different colors. Deng Xiaoping also remembered a sloping street named La Rue de la Sirene. There was no red light at halfway at that time, and Deng Xiaoping was able to ride his bike straight down to the end. He also remembered that he learned how to dance the waltz in Montagji and got into the habit of drinking coffee, eating croissant, and watch football matches. Now you are watching Xinhua Relay live streaming, marking the centenary of the May 4th movement. My colleagues in Paris and Beijing have already taken you to three important locations related to the May 4th movement. Now I'm in Park Duzi, one of the commemorative sites in connection with the work study movement in Montagji. Due to its historical links with China in the 1920s, this, the local tourist office in 2005 rolled out travel route featuring 12 Chinese trail sites. And this park is one of them. This photo was taken in July 1920. These youngsters were debating over the reform required to save China and the world. Following these meetings, these young men, these young men, named Cai Hesen, wrote a letter to his friend Mao Zedong proposing to establish a political party guided by Marxism. 
Mao had seen them off at the quayside when they left, but had personally stayed in China because, as he claimed, I still have so much to learn of my own country. The Communist Party of China was founded a few months later. The youngsters studying and working in France in the 1920s were the vanguard of their peers. They had great ideals and a flagging passion for the nation. Some of them even sacrificed their lives in pursuing their causes. As Chinese President Xi Jinping said in his speech marking the centenary of the May 4th movement days ago, young people always play a vanguard role in realized national rejuvenation. She also said that the May 4th movement gave birth to a great spirit centered on patriotism, progress, democracy, and science, with patriotism at the core. The diligent work frugal study movement in the 1920s was a fleeting moment in the long river of human history. Yet it made a far-reaching impact on China's modern history. Well, that's all about it from our live streaming in Montargis, the last episode of Xinhua Relay live streaming marking the centenary of the May 4th movement. If you missed the previous three episodes in Paris and Beijing, please play back this video later. Thank you very much for watching. We look forward to your company again soon. Don't forget to visit us on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. And don't forget to hit the like button below. And feel free to give your comments and share our program with your friends. Bye for now.